you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, welcome to another program of A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. This program is brought to you by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee and 30 faithful congregations of the Churches of Christ throughout this region of Tennessee and Kentucky and Illinois and Missouri. We're thankful for your watching today and thankful for their fine support of this program. Now we have three gospel preachers. They've been doing a great job the last three weeks in answering your questions. We're looking forward to their answers today. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. I'm Robert Taylor. I'm from Ripley, Tennessee. Do meeting work, lectureship work, and an immense amount of religious writing. My name is Hal Ferguson. I'm the Congregational Minister of the North Jackson Church of Christ in Jackson, Tennessee. I'm Skip Andrews. I preach for the Church of Christ in Dresden, Tennessee. Thanks again to these brethren for being with us today. Our first question goes to Brother Ferguson. Brother Ferguson, when the Bible says that we are to be perfect, what does that mean? The person says, I have always thought that only Jesus was perfect. Brother Ferguson. Thank you for that question. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 48, Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In James chapter 3, and verse 2, James writes, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Many of the verses of the scripture of the New Testament that use the word perfect uh, are using a, uh, a Greek word, or it's from a Greek word, uh, telos, which according to A.T. Robinson means end, goal, or limit. But there's also another word for perfect in the New Testament that is used. It's, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11, Paul says, finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, and so on. In that passage, the word here used for perfect is a different word, katartizo, and it means to be thoroughly or to thoroughly complete, to repair, or to mend. The idea behind these verses or the, this word, these words used in these different contexts, is the idea that God wants us to be spiritually mature. God wants us to make complete whatever is lacking in our lives, whatever is lacking in spiritual character, whatever is lacking in Christian character. Uh, uh, work toward repairing that. Make amends uh, in that area of your life which may be deficient. Reach your potential. Fulfill your goal or your end or your purpose. Keep striving to match the perfect example that was given by God's Son, Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Keep trying to be the very best that you can. And uh, Paul wrote, for example, of the great love of the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9. And he said concerning them that uh, concerning brotherly love, ye need not that I write anything unto you. And so Paul, this is a great compliment Paul was making toward these uh, brethren of Thessalonica. And yet he says in chapter 3 in verse 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men. And so as great as their love was, that Paul would even mention that, yet he, he understands that they have room for it to improve that, to, to grow in that, to abound in that. You see, none of us will ever reach a point in our lives where we are absolutely and flawlessly and sinlessly perfect. But we can be made entire, or we can be made complete, as Paul speaks of in Colossians 3, uh, 2 and verse 10, by first of all, obeying the gospel, putting on Christ in baptism, and then challenging ourselves every day to live the very best that we can, increase and abound in every good thing so that the very image of Christ can be found in us. Thank you very much for this question. Thank you. We appreciate that good answer very much. Our next question to Brother Andrews. Brother Andrews, is it possible 
for people to communicate with the dead. And we'll give that to Brother Andrews. Well, thank you again for the question and the research I did into it. Ends up with, I think, a fairly short answer, but I hope you'll think about it carefully. If God allowed communication with the dead, then the answer would be yes. But our research has to say, does he allow that? Is there any evidence that God allows us to communicate with the dead? In Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, verses 19 to 31, we see a man who was dead, who wanted to communicate with the living, and he was told no. They needed to just learn from the Bible the things they needed to know. So that was ruled out as an option in Luke 16. And so the dead cannot communicate with us. The other direction, we communicate with the dead, there's no hint in the Bible. There's some subjects you can research in the Bible and look for evidence to support a case, and it isn't there. There's nothing that says this is the way it works. So it isn't the way it works. God has not given us any hint, any information, any commandment, any inference, nothing that would encourage us to try to communicate with the dead. That is, they're not in this world anymore, and reaching out to them in that fashion just is not possible. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul used some language that I think can help us here with regard to the description of what the dead are to us. In verse 13, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If, um, and this has happened to me, when I would fall asleep in the living room and my wife Helen and our kids were doing things and then I would eventually wake up, they would realize that I had no idea what was going on while I was asleep. No matter what they said, it wasn't getting through to me. I wasn't being communicated with even if they tried, if I remained asleep, it wasn't happening. People who have died are, to us at least, asleep. There's no sending messages to them that they can receive. So Paul says about them, don't sorrow as the others that have no hope, because there's something coming, and that's a resurrection. At the resurrection, those things will be different. And so maybe the thing for us to keep in mind is, the communication we can have is not with the dead, but with one who was dead and is alive forevermore. Through him, Jesus Christ, we can communicate to the one we need to be communicating with, and that's his Father. And if we understand that, then we have the best possible open line we could ever want. Sometimes I try to describe this by saying, that if every person on earth right this minute were to approach God as he ought to be approached, and there are 7.1 billion people on the planet right now, he would not have any problem dealing with every one of us at the same time. Nobody has to get in line or wait their turn because it's, it's your turn. We can communicate through his son with him. Let's choose to do that and not speculate about the ways and means that men invent that don't work anyway. Thank you for asking. Thank you. You know, it's incredible in this age of unbelief when supposedly the majority of people are so cynical and materialistic that, that they've outgrown religion, that on the other hand you find so many people seeking communication with the dead. It's interesting, isn't it? Isaiah once talked about the futility of turning to mediums and things like that to obtain information. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20, he said, When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead... And then he said to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. These uh, mediums through their mutterings or altered, altered voices pretended to have you know, important information with the dead. But Isaiah got to the heart of the matter 
when he said to the law and to the testimony. That's where we find our truth and our direction for living, but it's tragic that people are turning to other things. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. And our tract today is entitled, The Vine and the Branches. It's a great tract. We're also offering our eight-lesson Bible correspondence course. Now, if you want that, we'll send you the first lesson. Uh, take that, study it in hand with your Bible, answer the questions, send it back to us. We'll grade it and send you lesson two. If you complete all eight lessons, uh, we'll send you a certificate for having completed the course. So if you'd like any of our free materials today on our Bible Answer, or to send us your question, just contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can email us at a Bible Answer at earthlink.net, or you can talk, call our toll-free number and tell us the materials that you would like to have, one 800 Four three six zero four six three. That is our toll free number. Be sure to leave now your full address in a clear uh, voice uh, if you receive the answer machine. Now back to our questions today. You also see there are our, our web address www.abibleanswertv.com. We encourage you to go to our website. Now to Brother Taylor, we have this question: When can a divorced Christian? Remarry. Brother Taylor. Thank you for the question. When my late father was born in 1901, there were only about 60 to 75,000 divorces in the entire nation. When he died in 1971, that number had increased to almost 775,000 divorces each year. That's what happened in the course of his average lifetime upon the earth. Marriage had its beautiful beginning in Genesis, the second chapter. Divorce came much later. And, of course, God's law on marriage is applicable to every person, to every man, every woman, every young person who enters into the marital, the marital mate, marital business. And yet the question has to do with divorce, Christian. If every person, every Christian man and every Christian woman married to each other, if each one of them would be faithful and loyal to the vows that they took faithfully and fervently at the marriage altar, then there would be no case of divorce between, between, the two, between any of the two of them because they would not have that one reason that is suggested in Matthew 19 and verse 9. Jesus has asked questions about marriage in Matthew, the 19th chapter. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Probably his detractors thought that he would go back to Deuteronomy. Instead, he went back to Genesis, the second chapter. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife. No longer shall they be two or twain, they shall be one flesh. And then Jesus announced that law that is so often unheeded in our day. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And then in Matthew, the 19th chapter and verse 9, I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which has put away, doth commit adultery. In order for a person to put away a mate, and be in position to marry another person who is eligible, there has to be the committing of fornication. Notice that Jesus said, except it be for fornication. The significance of that except means if and if only. One puts away a mate for fornication, is he or she in position to marry another? That means that the innocent person who has kept himself or herself perfectly pure has not deviated into adultery or fornication, is the one that is able to put away an adulterous mate. Jesus is not suggesting that it has to be done. He's suggesting that it may be done. I have known of a number of cases where adultery was committed and one of the mates was perfectly pure, the other had become immoral, and yet they worked through this tragedy, kept their marriage intact, and are still together today. 
I think of a number of couples of which I have the knowledge along that line. But it is the innocent person that has the right to put away the guilty person and be in position to marry another, and that another ought to be a person who is eligible that is in position to marry. The guilty party, in no sense of the term, is in position to marry. The guilty party is not in position to put away a, a guilty mate because he's the guilty mate, and therefore the guilty party is not in position to remarry at all. This is something that is ignored by the masses today, and we need a restoration of the teaching of the New Testament about the binding nature of marriage. Jesus is still on record as saying, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. It's a serious thing to put asunder that which God has joined together. Jesus meant to say, the husband is not to put it asunder, the wife is not to put it asunder. They are to form such a united and closely cemented couple that they will not allow any third party, either an in-law or outlaw, to interfere in this matter and to put asunder that which God has joined together. Divorce and Christian ought not to be related to each other, and they will not if every Christian man is faithful and every Christian woman is faithful to the vows that each one of them has, uh, has promised each other. I thank you for the good question. Thank you. To Brother Ferguson, this question. When should young people obey the gospel? Brother Ferguson. Thank you for the question. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. There was a time in Paul's life, he says, probably, obviously this was during his childhood, when he was not accountable to the law of God. That is, he didn't understand. He was a child. And, um, but he says, when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And I take that to mean that he reached an age of accountability where he knew right from wrong and he was accountable for his sin. But when this time came about, what was the, the age of the Apostle Paul when he became accountable, uh, when this condition existed in his life? The Scripture doesn't tell us that. Uh, there is no Scripture in the Bible that tells us the exact age that a person must be uh, in order to obey the gospel. However, that doesn't leave us without some principles that can help to guide us when uh, one is making that kind of a decision. And I would like to, su to suggest some guidelines that might prove helpful to us as a young person is considering uh, when to obey the gospel, or maybe perhaps as parents. Maybe you or as a parent are trying to uh, understand uh, uh, when you could expect, perhaps, that your child is ready to obey the gospel. And there are a number of events uh, that would need to take place and a number of concepts that would need to exist um, before that would be right and before a person would be ready to obey the gospel. For example, a person needs to be old enough or must be old enough to have a consciousness of his own self. Uh, he must have a self-awareness. Uh, a, a newborn baby does not have a self-awareness, is not aware of himself. He is there, he, he lies there, but as far as having a self-consciousness of himself, uh, he hasn't developed to that point yet. He must also be old enough to understand the difference between right and wrong. He needs to be old enough to understand when he has personally committed wrongdoing or sin and, and is able to feel a sense of guilt for doing wrong. He must be old enough to understand who Jesus is and what Jesus did to secure our salvation. He, he or she needs to be old enough to, to process information about Jesus into an intelligent belief or faith. And he needs to be old enough to confess with his mouth uh, his faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He needs to be old enough to understand that obedience to Jesus Christ in faith, repentance, confession of faith, and baptism for the remission of sins is essential to his soul's salvation and hope of living forever in heaven. And if a young person understands these things, if these things exist uh, with this person, then I would say that this person is old enough to obey the gospel. Thank you for this excellent question. Thank you. Our next question to Brother Andrews. Brother Andrews, why is it important for couples to take wedding vows in a formal ceremony? Brother Andrews. 
Thanks for asking. I'm going to approach this question as a matter of judgment or custom depending upon the time and place when the wedding t is occurring or the country where it is. I have done a wedding in India one time and their customs are of course different from ours but at the bottom line there is this law of marriage that's already been referred to in our program today that God instituted at the very beginning of time. And there are features of marriage that we can use in marriage vows to help two people understand what's going on. And so as a matter of custom, as we do marriage ceremonies in our land, vows are included. And I think it's based upon the importance of love, commitment, and trying to keep this marriage together. In 1968, I went to the Memphis School of Preaching as a student I've been doing this ever since then. In order to illustrate how old I am, I say that I began preaching in the middle of the last century, and I've been involved in a number of weddings. And I'm sad to tell you that maybe half of all the weddings I have performed are no longer marriages. They have chosen not to do that. They have chosen not to honor their vows. At the end of the Song of Solomon, the text says in Song of Solomon 8, 6 and 7, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned or despised. The fact is that we can let that happen. Love itself is a principle that can, it will work. In order for me to illustrate to you how important the vows can be, let me read the ones that I have edited and rewritten over the years to try to get the two people to see what they're doing. And I insist on them to repeat after me. I don't just read them. They say the vows. I Skip, come to you, Helen, to be your lawful and wedded companion, to live together after the ordinances of God in the honorable estate of matrimony. I do, in the presence of God and these witnesses, solemnly promise to love, honor, and cherish you as a gift and a help from God. I pledge my protection and providence to you in health and in sickness, in adversity and prosperity, and forsaking all others, will keep myself for you and you alone until death shall end this vow. Because I love you, Helen, I will honor these vows for the rest of my life. And then similar vows from the bride to her groom. That's why I do that, to try to impress upon this couple the principles that they say they're going to embrace and live by for the rest of their lives together. Thanks for asking. Thank you. And now to Brother Tyler, this question. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul deals with head coverings for women in the church. How does this apply today? Brother Taylor. Thank you for the question. I think it's essential that we understand something about the Corinth of the first century. It was one of the most corrupt and one of the most wicked cities on earth in that day. And in fact, fornication and adultery were as common in Corinthian society as eating their food and drinking their water at a meal. And the Apostle Paul had more to say in regard to adultery and fornication in the two Corinthian epistles than he did in any of the other epistles or letters that he wrote. It was a practice in the city of Corinth. One of the temples had 1,000 priestesses, religious harlots, and they sold their bodies to every lusty man that came along. Brother Rex A. Turner, a number of years ago, suggested that these abandoned women would often have inscribed on the soles of their sandals two words, follow me. And as those words were inscribed upon the dusty streets of Corinth, lusty men who had come from various parts of the Mediterranean world knew exactly what that meant. And it was the custom among these people, these abandoned women, that they would go without any kind of veil without any kind of covering. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with that 
as well as suggesting that uh, it ought to be the case in Corinth that the women go with their veils and not to be uncovered. How does that apply to us today? I was on a lectureship many years ago with Brother Roy Deaver out in Fort Worth, the Fort Worth lectureship, and he dealt with this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 11. He suggested if the time ever come when every impure woman in the city of uh, Fort Worth carries a red purse on her right hand, the, uh, Brother Deaver suggested I will argue from this position, from this from this scripture that it is a sin for a woman to carry a wed purse on a, re, on, a, on a right hand. And I think he had the right interpretation of this. It was not, it's not a custom today. We cannot tell whether a woman is covered or uncovered as far as the headgear is concerned, whether she's pure or impure, whether she respects her husband or disrespects him whether she recognizes the headship of man or does not recognize him. Hope this will be some help, and thanks for the question. Thanks to Brother Taylor, Brother Ferguson, Brother Andrews. We're doing such an outstanding job today in answering your questions. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate all of these great questions that have been sent in. In just a moment, you're going to see once again our contact information where you can write us, where you can call us, or where you can email us your question. Also, as we mentioned, our website, www.abibleanswertv.com. You can also go to our website and submit your Bible question through our contact page. Please do so. We appreciate so much these questions that are sent in. We've had so many good questions, and we're thankful for it. We're also thankful for our supporters. There are 30 congregations whose names you're about to see on the screen. Without them, a Bible answer would not be on the air in Tennessee, in Kentucky, in southern Illinois, and in eastern Missouri. We really appreciate them. and We want to encourage you to go by, stop in, worship with them whenever you might have the opportunity. I'm sure that they would be glad to see you and would welcome you at any and all of their services. We're very thankful to be entering a new year and thankful that you're with us today. Thanks for watching, and we pray that you'll be tuning in again next week. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the Faithful Church of Christ in your area.